And welcome to a special edition of Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your gatekeeper and your host here in Irondale. Email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at ew10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, the Magis Center website, incrediblecatholic.com, and Purposeful Universe as well. They all have different appeals for different people. Check them out. And Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EWTN On Demand page on our EWTN YouTube channel. And check out all of your favorite EWTN programs available on demand. We currently have almost 4,000 episodes available on our On Demand page, which is fairly new over the last year or so, populating it with great programs featuring Mother Angelica, Father Mitch, and of course the Daily Mass, which everyone loves, and great children's programming and always free and always available on our EWTN On Demand page. And that's not counting the tens of thousands of programs. We have almost 25,000 on our YouTube page as well. So check out our YouTube channel as well. And today we are taking your questions from you, the viewers. So we turn to the answer man himself here in his universe <laughs> to kick us off with a prayer, if you would, Father. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry, our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole audience, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so we have our, our kind of our mailbag here for questions and emails okay. and that we've gotten we haven't been able to get to in prior programs. I was going to ask you one question before we get into uh, these sure. particular ones, kind of a general one, but, you know, you travel about, you talk to all different groups, all different age groups from the mm -hmm. EWTN family celebration to high school students to college students. Sure. What is the, what question do you get the most often? Well, um, it, it depends, uh, you know, on the audience sometimes, but universally, if it's a young person, mm -hmm. it's definitely uh, about evidence for God or Jesus in some form or another. Or uh, sometimes they have heard some kind of an objection uh, to the Christian faith and they want an answer to it, you know, that, uh, you know, um, you know, is Jesus really just uh, a figment of somebody's uh, ancient imagination mm -hmm. or um, was, is there really any historical evidence for Jesus beyond the New Testament? I get a lot of that. I definitely get a lot of uh, um, our faith and science contradictory questions. Mm -hmm. Definitely get a lot of those. Now, now that's more the young uh, group uh, probably up to about 35 mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be on the mind uh, and then when you get above 35 uh, oftentimes the questions um, you know, do concern morality uh, I think a lot of transgenderism mm -hmm. um, uh, questions a lot of questions concerning uh, abortion or um, you know uh, uh, maybe homosexual lifestyle maybe the um, you know the uh, uh, difficulties uh, with, um, you know, uh, a physician-assisted suicide, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et and some of the more political things that are coming about. Uh, certainly, I get a lot of questions about our uh, politicians. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's out there too. I think there's a natural curiosity, but it really does differ um, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the, the two groups. I'd say the the over 35 is more interested in the moral questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the under 35 is more interested in is there any evidence for God or Jesus or the church or something of that nature? I don't, I used to get some scandal questions. Mm -hmm. um, those things now are pretty much, uh, really I don't get any uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a normal um, thing unless the, the topic would more or less bring it about. But, but by and large, I don't get spontaneous yeah. questions about that anymore. But I do get questions, um, a lot of them about morals and a lot of them about okay science and uh, evidence. Okay, very good. Let's move on to some of the questions people did send in specifically. Uh, dear Father mm -hmm. Spitzer, speaking of young people, recently my 30-something single nephew announced that he doesn't want children and intends to get a vasectomy for the sake of the environment. Oh, boy. 
He said he has given it a lot of thought, and if he changes his mind about raising a child in the future, he will adopt. How do I respond, Donna? Well, there's nothing wrong, of course, with adopting, uh, so I don't want to say that, but I would say getting a vasectomy, um, first of all, you know, if you uh, get married, one of the wonderful parts of marriage that the Catholic Church and Jesus teach is to have children. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, the objective of, of uh, you know, uh, sexuality is to have children. There's a very good reason for that. Uh, not only that you're bringing this new creation of this transcendental being into the world, uh, which of course is what God intends us to do in our sexual union, in our marital unions. I mean, that's the first thing. Uh, but the second thing is, is that it does good for the family, the marriage. Kids reflect back in so many wonderful ways, even though sometimes they can have their tantrums. Sometimes it can be a real pain. Sometimes they can, you know, do things that are very mischie mischievous and so forth and so on. So you think to yourself, hmm, you know, um, uh, is it all worth it? And in the end, all parents will say, of course it was worth it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the lovableness of children and the love that they reflect back to the parents, the way that they interact with one another. By the time you are, you know, my age and, and you've been, uh, you know, married for 40, 50 years, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, I mean, when you're married and, and you raised those kids, 90% of the time, parents are so happy they did it. Mm. They would never have a life without their kids. Mm. And so you, you just, you know, for the sake of the marriage, for the sake mm. of you and your, your spouse individually, for the sake of bringing that transcendent, mm -hmm. creative, eternal being into the world that will share your life in all eternity. And, and, and you know, that is, you know, kind of the outcome of the, uh, of, uh, you know, the, the sexual relationship of marriage, which is not an end in itself, but is meant uh, to, to be, uh, um, you know, a means of bringing about this new soul um, that will uh, mm -hmm. come into the world. Because every time a child comes in the world, God endows that uh, child, uh, that little uh, zygote with a soul, mm -hmm. immediately upon uh, fertilization conception. And, and that's an eternal soul. <coughs> and it's meant for eternal joy with you forever mm -hmm. in heaven <clears throat> and with God. So um, that would be the main thing uh, to remember. The, the other thing I think which is key uh, too is, you know, the idea that you would not do this for the environment. Right is really false. I've, I've got a brand new book coming out November 1st. Please just read the section there on uh, the overpopulation myth and birth control. Right. It's the second part of my birth control explanation and just read that because honestly um, the overpopulation myth it is a myth. Right. And, and the reason that it is is because uh, in about um, 2076 we're going to reach a point where um, we're going to flatten out in the birth rate and then the birth rate is going to plummet and as it plummets countries like our own developed countries as opposed to developing countries mm -hmm. that population implosion is going to cause huge pressures not only on our economy and our financial system and but it's going to lay incredible burdens on the people who are here to succeed them and that's even mm -hmm. with the most liberal immigration policies we can imagine we are not having enough children even elon musk right admits, absolutely right, right. And this right. implosion is going to be devastating to the world economies and everybody continues to per per perpetuate propagate this myth of, of an explosion when literally in 2076 we're facing a radical implosion of population and the pressures that will be put on the younger generation to supply the older generation with the needed requirements and the, you know to keep the economy up and to keep that creativity up. Only people can do this. Computers are not going to be able to do this. So we really, we really do need people. We right. really do need your son to have some children uh, for the sake right. of uh, not just the economy, but for the sake of the world, the sake of world creativity. And you never know what that child may do in this lifetime. So I think it's uh, he's making a decision well, based on very what, false evidence. Yeah, well, why do you think that is? Obviously, you, 
you, you hear and see some of this stuff where these people, the young people are like terrified of the Armageddon, uh, of the climate, you know, uh, apocalypse that's uh, about to happen and this Malthusian, you know, yeah. connection with uh, Paul Ehrlich, yeah. with, you know, and these kinds of things. But why, why are they being taught this when it's just not even scientifically true, at least as far as the population? Well, it's almost like they're turning human beings into a virus that needs to be controlled because it's harming the planet. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's two false dichotomies that are going on. Uh, first is that because the population uh, increased in times past, um, they are inferring that it will continue to do so indefinitely when all of the demographic data shows exactly the opposite. By the way, I'm quoting um, uh, The Lancet, which is the number one medical journal uh, in Great Britain, right. and these demographics are in The Lancet, just set out as clearly as you can see it. 2076, take my word for it, the implosion's coming. The leveling off, we're already in the midst of the leveling off. And, and of course, in our country, in the developed world, there's already a super leveling off. So this myth is, I mean, this inference mm -hmm. that we're going to continue to have um, population growth indefinitely, um, you know, that will lead uh, to an explosion is just wrong. We have the data. Even, as I said, Elon Musk has said this repeatedly, mm -hmm. that we cannot afford to continue doing this. Nobody, uh, as he says, wants to listen to it. There's a second uh, dichotomy uh, that is absolutely false that is also going on. In some parts of the environmentalist movement, they are actually trying to say that, um, you know, we're, human beings are in competition with the environment. Mm -hmm. But that was an old Malthusian myth, too. That is not true anymore. In fact, mm -hmm. I answer this step by step. How about food production? Technology has resolved these things. We can actually we could make our food production 10 times what it is, and we can do it through hydroponic farming, multi-level, um, you know, hydroponic farms. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will cost some investment to create um, these hydroponic farms, but they will be 10 times more efficient than actually, you know, farming in, in, in soil-based, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, old techniques, we'll call that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can actually increase that by a factor of 10 times, and then that's going to far exceed any food production that's needed. We can actually, now the, the it's very cheap to, desal, uh, to, to do water desalinization right. compared to what it was even 10 years ago. I mean, by the time we're done, we're going to have technologies that will be able to, to desalinate water at a very, very um, uh, rapid rate for very, very little money because the electrical power required for desalinization has, uh, you know, dropped considerably as the technology technology has improved. I mean, you look at, you know, solar power, you look at synthetic fuels, you look at, um, you know, they say, well, are we going to run out of, um, you know, fuel? No, we're not going to run out of fuel. Again, another myth. And of course, the idea that adding people to the world will add uh, to the pollution and to the climate change is just simply false. Mm -hmm. We have techniques right now which can resolve so much, you know, so, so much of the pollution that's going into the air can be scrubbed. And it's not just by electrical vehicles or something of that nature. It, they're, they're actually much, much cleaner vehicles uh, that we can have, much cleaner ways of scrubbing the air, and we can recirculate that carbon and actually use the carbon that we're recirculating Mm -hmm. to create additional fuels. These are not just pie-in-the-sky technologies. They're proven technologies, and they're being brought up to the point where we can actually utilize them, scale them up to actually uh, use a uh, manufacture them on a big level and uh, to produce them. They're all coming at once. And by the way, I should tell you, solar power, uh, you know, the, the technology increases in solar power are also absolutely remarkable. Over the last 10 years, the efficiency mm -hmm. in solar plates, et cetera, are just much, much higher. So my point that I'm, I'm trying to make is technology has always been the X factor that has solved the Malthusian um, problem. Malthusian problem, there's a guy named Thomas Malthus, he was a, 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 an Anglican cleric and an economist that said, look, the population's um, uh, uh, going up uh, geometrically, that is to say exponentially, mm -hmm. while the, um, the resources are going up arithmetically. We're going to hit a crisis. People will be at each other's throats. There will be all kinds of diseases 
prices, so much competition for the scarce mm -hmm. resources. If we don't control our population, it's going to be curtains. Well, why didn't it ever happen? Why is it that the GNP worldwide has gone up by a factor of five times while the population rate has increased? Why is it that people aren't starving the way Malthus thought? Why is it that the UN uh, uh, the sustainability goals, why is it that we have made 50 percent of the way mm -hmm. to the UN sustainability goals? We've, you know, basically taken almost a billion people off of the water crisis problem. We've taken almost three quarters of a billion people off of the food crisis. Mm -hmm. We've taken a half a billion people off of the disease. Uh, um, uh, we're, I mean, we're past, halfway past the UN sustainability goals in a mere 10 years. Why? Technology, 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 and the willingness for people to have public-private partnerships mm -hmm. and the willingness for people to apply that technology and use that technology in order to improve the human condition in the developing world. Mm -hmm. And this is going on right now. So the point that I'm trying to get to is I think this is a major, major problem. This dichotomy between human beings and the environment it is a false um, um, uh, dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Technology has always mediated that, um, that technology, and I hope if people would read that chapter in my book, right. you will see that it is clearly the case, and um, that as we kind of clunk along, and actually we're actually accelerating along very, very rapidly, um, we're not experiencing a single thing that Malthus right. thought. And that's why I think Elon Musk is absolutely correct in saying, this is ridiculous. We ought to be having more people very, very quickly, especially in the developed nations. Right. The developing nations, they'll have enough uh, substitution. In the developed uh, nations, even with a huge and liberal uh, immigration policy, we'll never be able to catch up. If we allow our uh, population rates to slip below 1.7, we're just going to contribute to the implosion like you cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. And already, it's uh, you know, we're approaching 1.7. I mean, the U.S. is a little uh, more fortunate. I mean, Europe, I mean, are you kidding yeah. me? Europe is just going to have to, Russia, uh, you know, immigrate, uh, immigrate, Russia's immigrate. A mess oh, Russia, with that. Absolutely. And Japan, Japan. is a major. I mean, yeah. they've done studies on where, mm -hmm. when Japan's going to die out, basically. Yeah, Italy. Right. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Even right. It, it, it's also interesting because a lot of young people, you know, they get caught up in this. I saw uh, a story the other day with these these young gentlemen who were wanted a farming outlawed, you know, to protect the environment, you know. And of course, the question was, well, what were you planning on eating? <laughs> Maybe Soylent Green, but uh, it's the right year for it, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, it's just this kind of disconnectedness, like right. a, this focus on oh, yeah. an individual thing without understanding the big picture yeah. you know what I mean oh, yeah. it's like the Absolutely. global thing right and we have the same thing with you know if you look at the uh, carbon emissions the United States has done great over the years Europe has done better but yeah. th that doesn't account for India yeah. and China going through the roof if we're in a global economy yeah, the entire true. globe has to cooperate otherwise it doesn't make any difference absolutely and that's right so I mean uh, all I can say is uh, uh, you know, and those are developing economies, I might point out, too. Yes, they have good technologies in China and mm -hmm. to a, a, a certain extent as well in, in India coming up very rapidly. Both of them have highly educated, technologized mm -hmm. uh, populations. But a, as the technology spreads, uh, you know, they're going to have to become responsible for right. the pollution that they're emitting, et cetera. But the, the point that is really clear overall is that it, a myth is a myth is a myth right. is a myth. Right. And overpopulation is the best myth, and it's perpetuated on the basis of, you know, um, uh, the inference that uh, uh, the, the growth in the population is going to continue, right. and it's not. It's, it's also a money maker. In, it's it's a money maker, though, though too. It's That's also, the problem with yeah, these things absolutely. is they become self-perpetuating yeah. money makers. Where if you want to make money yeah. or get involved with money, I mean, one of the things they're trying to deal with yeah. solar panels now get a grant is get the old mm -hmm. solar panels. What do you do with them? Yeah. What do you do yeah. with the old ones? They can't yeah, be reused, no. and now they're out no, of date. They can't and, really. and so, what are you yeah. going to do with them? Where are you going to bury them? Whose yeah. backyard do they get yeah, buried? Exactly. So, anyway, yeah, okay. Exactly. Now, on a different topic, dear Father Spitzer, <laughs> yeah. our soul will be reunited with our body at the resurrection. 
but will our mind also be re reunited with our body so that we retain our memories of earthly things and our life on earth or will our minds be transformed in such a way that we will not have any of these thoughts mark yeah martha the mind and the soul are one mm -hmm. so when people use that word mind uh, they mean what we mean by soul that part of the body that survives uh, bodily death uh, that I've talked about with respect to those near-death experiences. And as you can see, when the soul leaves the body in those near-death experiences, yes, all of your memories are intact. You remember, in fact, you remember more lucidly uh, than uh, when you were on Earth. Let's say you were, if you were at an older age and were starting to get a little, a few of those uh, little, uh, uh, let's say slowdowns in the older person's category. <laughs> and so uh, the idea is that, uh, yes, all of those memories remain intact. You remember your life on Earth. You remember your relationships with people. Uh, of course, you remember your native language, if it were English, etc. And so, um, yeah, you have no worries. It will all be there. And it's not just from um, the fact that um, uh, we know this from uh, near-death experiences, but also that's part of our Catholic doctrine uh, that the resurrection does include continuity uh, with our uh, mind and embodiment when we were on Earth. Okay. So, uh, very good. Um, there it is. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, number seven, uh, another oh, question Mark, for you. That's okay. Dear Father Spitzer, now the only people we can be assured that are in heaven are those canonized by the Church. If we pray to a deceased loved one for their intercession and they are unknown to us to be in hell, are we opening ourselves to demonic activity? Michelle. Michelle, no. I just think that, you know, um, if you're praying to someone, you're not trying to communicate with them, not trying to conjure them up, mm -hmm. not trying to do anything that would be against the church's law. Right, if you're basically just praying to them for some kind of intercession, no, of course not. Uh, I mean, especially if this were a very good person who remained faithful in the Catholic Church, of course you can uh, pray f to them, you know, for some kind of help or appeal. Uh, I do certainly, you know, I'm talk to my mother and my father all the time, you know. Right. Uh, especially, you know, I know my uh, my mother seems to be channeled half the time through <laughs> one of my assistants. So I, I just uh, can't be even believe it. Dear Joan there, you know, she uh, mm. uh, she says things that, you know, come right out of my mother's <laughs> playbook. And I go, where'd you get that line from? from? <laughs> and, uh, I go, uh-huh, uh-huh. So uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, I do pray uh, to my mom. And I remember once my uh, my sister, right after the funeral for my mom, you know, we had gone down to the out, uh, we come from Hawaii, so mm. we went to the Outrigger Canoe Club to have dinner. Mm. And my sister said, you know how mom loved the green flash? Well, the green flash was something that happened right on the south shore there on Waikiki Beach. It would happen rarely, but it was, when it happened, it was very noticeable. Mm -hmm. And uh, Louise said, oh, I bet, you know, mom will uh, make her favorite green flash happen. Um, you know, today, and we're sitting there eating dinner, and the sun just hits that part of the horizon, mm. and bam, big green flash. And I just said, "Well, mom just winked her eye at us." That's right. So, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think it's uh, a problem to pray uh, to them, and you certainly right. your intention is not to invoke the demonic or get a power, uh, you know, that's uh, beyond what you should be having, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. you you don't if you're not if your intention is not to invoke the demonic, you just pray to. Uh, your good deceased relative, and I right. don't, you, you will not be channeling any demonic. Person. Right, and you pray for them throughout because you don't know what their status yeah, is. Yeah, so. I pray. Oh, I definitely pray for my mom, for my dad. I definitely pray. I'm not taking any chances. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Here's another question, and my dear, too. dear Father Spitzer. I've often wondered if angels can communicate with an ordinary person. Can angels? warn someone something is about to happen. I believe that years ago I was given a warning from someone or something, but I'm not sure if it was an angel or not. Anthony. Anthony, I totally believe that. I totally, I know people, you know, that, for example, are in a big city and maybe their mind is wandering, they were crossing the street and, mm -hmm. and um, all of a sudden, uh, they'll hear something like stop as you know in their minds as mm. as if it were you know somebody was just saying that to them and they halt and car comes you know 
you know, tunneling down the street, you know, at 80 miles an hour and passes him by and they go, who, who said stop? And mm. there's no one around. You know, I've actually known people who were crossing a street and just got pushed back mm. by no scene a visible force uh, just you know push back and then the car careens down I've known um, you know uh, uh, people who uh, well at least they've told me mm -hmm. this that uh, you know they were in a car accident and and um, you know they were thrown you know uh, uh, through the car and that uh, you know a very nice uh, long-haired individual uh, came down a very beautiful looking uh, person came down and actually moved them mm -hmm. over you know to uh, a, a part of the street where they could be uh, uh, you know wow. tended to and mm -hmm. out of the way of the traffic where they had been uh, thrown and um, then they looked around uh, the person who you know they, they said well somebody move me here and they said well who and they're just not there. I mean, they vaporized. I mean, we've all heard of those stories again and right. again and again and again. Or you know, the the one story with the you know the the uh, the little kid in his Cub Scout, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, uniform is is stopping this uh, car, and uh, it's a physician, and he says, you know, my friends need some help, and the doctor says, well, what do you mean? And he says, you know, well, uh, you know, this. Uh, this, uh, you know, our bus has cascaded over the side, and uh, of the of the hill. And the mm. doctor says, "I don't see anything." And he goes, "Please, just come and you know, mm. I'll tell you, you know, where to find him." And of course, you know, then uh, you know he he sees the bus. He you know he starts rescuing the kids and so right. and so on. And then he gets to the back of the bus and. And there's the kid who, with the Cub Scout uniform, but he looks just like the kid who stopped him on the highway. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, but he's dead. You know, he was right. he was deceased. And um, but the the point is, these things happen all the time. Right. Now that case was a human agent, but in other cases, I really do believe they're angelic right. agents, and I really do believe it right. happens. I, I, I mean, I just know so many people to whom it's uh, happened. Right. Um, so uh, I, I would say. Right. Um, uh, yeah, believe it. Believe right. it. Uh, they're Absolutely. Really angelic inner. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure. Thing. I'm pretty sure in Raymond's book about mother, uh, if I recall it correctly, mother believes that she was crossing the street. Uh, I don't know if it was in Canton or exactly where, and she was stepping out and she yeah. got pulled back, like you were almost describing. Yeah. And she really believes that yeah. an angel pulled her out of the street. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, she would have been killed. Oh yeah, I mean, so. um, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've got all kinds of stories just of myself, not mm. as obvious as those. Right. But, oh, I've I've heard a lot of them, and uh, I've heard, a, you know, a lot of you know beings that have helped out a person, and then the guy turns around, and uh, you know, and says, "Thanks, ah, mm. you really rescued me," you know, and they're not they're there. Not there, right? You know, <laughs> and so. Uh, yeah, I always so, think uh, of but, uh, generally, uh, really simple ones, yeah. even like you were describing. In a sense, uh, you're sitting at a stoplight and the light changes, and for some reason you have this yeah. feeling, don't go. And then as you start yeah. to go, some car runs the red light. You know what I mean? And it's kind of yeah. like, oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lord. You just know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I just can't even tell you the number of times that, you know, I've, you know, even, either in a small plane or, a, mm -hmm. you know, in a, or in a car, you mm -hmm. know, where I've had such a close call and, mm -hmm. you know, one second one way or another, and you think, oh my gosh, you know, this could have been a disaster. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> truly. Thank you. Truly. Exactly. Yeah. We got. Uh, yeah. Let's see. One one minute uh, to the break, so we'll at least get sure. get started with this. Uh, dear Father okay. Spitzer, I receive an inordinate amount of mail and religious articles from religious organizations soliciting money, hopefully not EW10. I have a few favorite rosaries <laughs> and medals of saints. What should I do with the rest? I don't know if these have been blessed. Well, if they're selling them, they shouldn't be. Uh, I don't want to throw yeah. them in the trash because of what they are and what they represent and who they represent. Judy. Yeah, hey Judy, you know what I would do? I'd just collect all that into a bag and I'd probably just bring it down to your church because there's all kinds of people, you know, I, I meet them every day, you know, who, um, you know, I say, oh, you know, I, uh, you know, I'll, here, I'll give you a rosary or something. Mm -hmm. Somebody will come down or some little kid mm -hmm. will want uh, a rosary or a medal or something and so I could give them away 
um, you know, as really, really fast. But I mean, I think most parish priests always mm -hmm. have lots of, you know, opportunities to give them to kids and to give them to people who can't afford mm -hmm. them. Uh, so don't throw them away. Right. They really are religious objects, but I would just say give them to somebody who can give them away to uh, people who can really use them. Or you could just leave them in the back of the church and just say right. uh, rosaries uh, available free of charge, a little sign. and. Um, you know, a lot of people, you'd be surprised. That's the one right. Sunday, you can have 30 of those rosaries, and they'll be gone by the end of Mass. Well, I'll tell you I mean, one thing. We, we, we always found that when we'd go to the NCTA, the cable shows, well, the secular things, trust me, all the yeah. rosaries disappeared. So with that uh, oh, yeah. being said, we're going to take yeah. a break here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Yeah. Answering your questions, stay with us. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe, where he is Mr. Universe, the answer man, and we're <laughs> peppering him with your questions. So we're going to continue there. So it's nothing like setting him up for fall uh, there. So here's, here's another <laughs> exactly. question for you, Father. Dear Father Spitzer, I sometimes read a prayer that I feel I would like to pray. Is it okay to pray that prayer even if it's not from a Catholic source, Todd? Sure. I mean, a prayer is a good prayer. Mm. And uh, so, you know, in the uh, military, of course, you know, there's all kinds of ecumenical prayers and football games, you know, with the mm -hmm. team before the game. You know, you can have ecumenical prayers. Uh, I've been there uh, saying a prayer with um, the Protestants. The Protestant ministers have been there saying prayer with Catholic players. Uh, so, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. uh, you can say a prayer unless there's something in the prayer mm -hmm. uh, that is obviously right. contrary to Catholic doctrine, but if there's not, uh, that's a prayer is a prayer, and join um, in with your good uh, uh, colleagues, um, you know, as the opportunity uh, allows, and, uh, and if it's a prayer that you get from uh, a book that's a Christian book or something, and it uh, has good Orthodox uh, 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 teaching implicit in the prayer, um, yeah. go ahead and pray it. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, I have a rosary app on my phone that I use to pray a uh -huh. daily rosary, like EWTN's. Uh, a friend told me that mm -hmm. one must use the physical rosary beads to gain the most grace from the rosary. I never heard this one. I think that is wrong, well, and that one obtains equal grace whether they use beads, an app, their fingers, or any other tool. The important part is to pray the rosary. Am I correct? And this is Flora. Flora, you're absolutely correct. Right, yeah. Do not pass go. Don't think about it. You don't need rosary beads to play, pray the rosary well. The main thing is the prayers, the intention, the connection with Mary, the per, uh, connection with the Lord. That's the, the main point, and you've got it all down. And if the app is what you do, the app is fine. And uh, the, to the extent that you really want to connect with our Lord and with um, the Blessed Virgin, that's just perfect. Right. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, nothing could be better. So don't worry right. about that. That's yet another, uh, as I say, urban legend. Right. So, it's also so, one of those ones yeah. where you get somebody who's, you know, you're trying to do the right thing and then you're getting this kind of like, well, that's okay, but you, what you really should be doing is this. Uh, you know, yeah, it's the like, moral high ground, friend. right? Right, right, oh, right. Yeah. Yes, uh, that, that's okay, <laughs> oh, yeah. but I've got the traditional beads here. Okay, uh, yeah. next up for yeah, Father Spitzer. modern Gnostic movement. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's right. That's that's good yeah. for you, I guess, but for those of us who are really well, I've ascending. Got the real perfection. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear Father Spitzer, every year before our annual parish picnic, our pastor has to pray for a good day may even be one of the petitions during Mass. I've always accepted this as legitimate prayer. I heard another priest state that God's not a weatherman. Any comment would be appreciated. Cassie. I, <laughs> I, Cassie, I pray for the weather anytime you want to pray for the weather. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I, I know uh, 
uh, many a soldier and many a coach who's prayed for good <laughs> weather. And of course, uh, many a priest who's prayed for good weather during mm. all kinds of assemblies and convocations. And, uh, you know, I mean, of, of course you could pray. And can God uh, work his little miracles even on the weather? Of course God can do that. So uh, there's just, you know, uh, uh, we don't know how, how he can insert himself, mm -hmm. but of course God is concerned with the weather if we're concerned about the weather because he's concerned about us. Mm -hmm. So if it's within his will and he can do something about it, of course you can um, uh, pray for that petition. And he right. loves us and he does try to help us. And um, absolutely, you, you just pray that weather prayer and um, I think uh, God would love to hear from you about it. Absolutely. After all, General Patton believed in it, as we know. This, he asked for a <laughs> he prayer for good, for good weather, uh, for for some other right. reasons. Chaplain, there, that were more suspect. I want but. a weather prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. exactly. Here's another question, <laughs> dear Father Spitzer. My mother recently died from Alzheimer's. Before she died, she received an apostolic pardon. My understanding is it was a conditional pardon because due to her Alzheimer's, she could not fulfill the requirements. A priest friend told me we should trust in the mercy of God and is convinced that the pardon was valid. He said he has even given the pardon to people who have already died. Is, this, is he correct? Chris. Well, Chris, I mean, the main thing that matters, um, as you know, as I mean, the apostolic pardon is a very good thing. And I think, you know, um, if you have that, that's nice. But much more important and major than the apostolic pardon is that you are truly repentant for your sins mm -hmm. um, as you're approaching death, that you receive the sacraments, right? And you can actually receive three of them. You can get absolution for your sins before you die. Then you can also have a little fragment of the Holy Eucharist. Uh, some, uh, some, if you're capable of receiving the mm -hmm. Holy, Holy Eucharist, fine. But you can also just put a little viaticum on the tongue there and um, receive that and then get the, um, the last rites, then get uh, the sacrament of the sick as mm -hmm. well. And all three of them at the time of death, that's what's really important. So true repentance for sins, then of course the, the sacraments, then if you want an add-on like an apostolic blessing, that's fine. But the church's sacraments are sufficient mm -hmm. for salvation. And especially if those sacraments are received, right? The, there's true contrition for sins. You get the absolution. That's what's sufficient for salvation. Um, the apostolic uh, pardon, that's a nice thing too, um, you know, with respect to some forms of, uh, of uh, you know, maybe uh, a perceived uh, temporal punishment or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe uh, that uh, can be very, very helpful. But uh, again, do not worry whether the person got the apostolic pardon. Worry more about the sacraments. And I, I'm afraid sometimes right. people are worried about the apostolic pardon more than they're worried about the sacraments and true contrition for sins. So we don't want to treat that like it's something right. magic. Right. Um, uh, we want to really uh, uh, make it something that's well, additional ask, and right. good. Let me, but, uh, let me ask you one part of that that, that uh, confused sure. me a little bit. As I understand the idea of, of her situation, it's conditional because obviously you rely on God's. But the oh, idea, yeah. can you give an, a pardon like this to somebody who is already dead? Was she kind of... Well, well uh, we don't believe that anymore because, of okay. course, you, in order for grace to be effective, it's got to be voluntary. Okay. Um, now, there are some people who say, well, I give it to them when they're dead anyway because I'm assuming that, you know, maybe, you know, they um, intended, uh, you know, before, you know, one second before they died to do this or something okay. of that nature. My thought is if the intention of the person is there, you know, then, um, you know, that should be sufficient. Gotcha. But if a person is unconscious, mm -hmm. absolutely I give them mm -hmm. uh, the sacraments. I give them the provisional, um, you know, uh, absolution mm -hmm. because I'm figuring they're hearing me. Right. And uh, I always just say, you know, even if I don't get an acknowledgement, I just say, you know, um, I'm assuming you're hearing me and, uh, you know, if you are hearing me, just be sorry for your sins. I give them the 
uh, conditional absolution. I absolutely, if they're unconscious, I give them last sacraments. Of course, I right. don't give them the, the Holy Eucharist because they can't uh, really uh, receive it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I uh, do give the other two sacraments, and I will do it right up to the point where that person is declared dead, okay. because I figure they can hear everything right. um, uh, up until that point, and I have every reason to suspect it for a variety of reasons. Uh, from some of which concern these near-death studies that I've talked about before. Okay. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. when I die, I will be judged immediately. If I'm saved, would I be in heaven with God and my loved ones? If so, what is the purpose of the final judgment at the end of time? If I'm in heaven since I died, what changes at the end of the world at the final judgment? Michael. Well, here's the deal, Michael. I know there's a great deal of confusion around this, and it's uh, uh, it, it comes actually um, from uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into the origins. Mm -hmm. The main thing, though, is is um, at the final judgment, you are going to have a glorified body, and you are going to be <clears throat> in a condition like Christ's glorified body at the end of time. Does the final judgment mean you're going to be rejudged? No. I mean, if you are already going to purgatory, mm -hmm. so you die and you go to purgatory, you're already judged fit mm -hmm. to go to purgatory. You're not going to be rejudged for what has already happened. When you're in purgatory, as you're making your way along to, in purgatory, let's suppose that you have, uh, you know, done the, the preparation, right? You've done the purification of your soul. You're ready to go. God's going to make the determination when you're ready. Mm -hmm. He's not going to say, wait, got to wait <laughs> until the final judgment. So when you are ready to go, you are ready to go, and God will take you into the kingdom. Once you're in the kingdom of God, you're not going to get rejudged. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not like, um, you know, if you're, as you put it, you're safe and with, you're with your family members. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get rejudged. But I look at it as the final judgment is uh, the final um, part of the resurrection. That's where all of us are given the glorified body. When all of us are given um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the power of the risen Christ mm -hmm. in glory and, and in spirit, and we are brought to our final um, uh, as it were, state of, uh, of, uh, of resurrection through Jesus Christ with everybody who is in the kingdom of God who has died before us. Mm -hmm. I think the saints will also undergo uh, a final transition in that final judgment too, even though they've been in heaven since they died. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, they will still have that one last part where they're brought fully into the whole um, mystical uh, body, into the whole kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. in the, the, the most glorious way of Jesus Christ imaginable. So that's how I uh, look at the, uh, the final judgment. But final judgment does not imply a rejudging mm -hmm. of you um, in your heavenly um, journey. Right. So uh, you, yes, the answer is yes, you will be safe with your family members if you uh, move through uh, purgatory and you're in heaven, or even if you're in purgatory, mm -hmm. you're not going to hell. So right. it's a matter of time before you move into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, dear Father Spitzer, I know that Jesus said that we are not to be anxious about anything but to cast our fears onto him. Am I offending our Lord when I feel anxious about watching my 84-year-old father struggle to overcome an emergency amputation of his leg? My, I, I lie awake at night worrying over whether he will ever recover and if my parents be able to continue to live in their home. I constantly pray about this, but still continue to worry. Kathy, poor Kathy. Well, Kathy, yeah, Kathy, uh, much of worry is not controllable, to be honest right. with you. I mean, there are some people who, um, you know, are just very cool-headed people, um, you know, and there's some people who, you know, just really, uh, as my mother always used to tell me, it's a mother's job to worry. <laughs> and I'd say, Mom, don't worry. <laughs> my line was always, what could possibly go wrong? And my mother would go, oh. I can think of 80 things, you know, and I would just say, that's okay. I'm never going to ask that question again. But the, the point is, is that, yeah, some people really do worry. And, um, you know, and if, 
the reason you're worrying is because you love them. Mm. The reason you're worrying is because you're concerned about how you're going to take care of them. And those are legitimate worries. However, you know, the, the point that Jesus is saying is, give this over to me. You know, let me have some of that. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're sinning if you get worried, especially if you're worrying spontaneously and so forth, right? I mean, it's just one of the things. You, you love people, you worry for them. That's just mm -hmm. the way it happens. And so the, the main thing is, is um, just try to give over what you mm -hmm. can get over, give over to the Lord. And then, right, don't don't worry about worrying right. because of course uh, that can be even you know exacerbate you know your difficulties so don't, yeah god doesn't take any offense at your worrying right. Right. but what he's trying to tell you is for your own peace of mind give some of that to me i can help you out I can watch over you in ways that you don't even know. I can help out your dad in ways that you don't even know. Just trust me as much as you can trust me. Keep handing it over to me. I always have a, you know, um, a little prayer. I've got two little prayers. Uh, one of them is, I give up, Lord. <laughs> you take care of it. Uh, that's one of my uh, definite favorites. My other one is sometimes when you get that sense of foreboding or some sort of thing like, like something's going to happen to me. I feel like the sword of Damocles is going to drop, mm -hmm. and I feel like there's like a you know some darkness out there that's coming near me, some depression or anxiety that's overwhelming me. There's something beyond my control that's that's you know m malevolent or something. Mm -hmm. I always just put my hands up like this and I shove back. And I just say, Lord. Please push back the foreboding. Mm -hmm. Just push back this foreboding. Push back this darkness. Push back the cause of this darkness. You know, if I do that about 10 times, it actually, I really do feel a sense of relief from the anxiety that's overrun. Almost mm -hmm. as if God is doing something or the Holy Spirit's right. doing something to take care of the cause mm -hmm. of that anxiety. So anyway, that's my yeah. formula, but those well, are two prayers it reminds uh, that, me uh, that may work. Right. It reminds yeah. me of, uh, of one thing. We do a show called Answering the Call with Mother Angelica with on radio with Father yeah. Joseph. And uh, one of the yeah. uh, in one of the calls where Mother talked about worrying and fear, she said, you know, I have total yeah. faith in my head, but my faith hasn't made its way down to my stomach yet. So though I'm, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> though I, yeah. under, I, I have exactly. that faith, it doesn't mean that I, you know, I'm not going forward yeah. with one foot in the air and a queasy feeling in my stomach. So. You know, oh, yeah. You know. And look at, you know, I mean, our Lord was not anxiety free when he faced mm -hmm. uh, his crucifixion at the right. Garden of Gethsemane because he says, you know, Heavenly Father, let this yeah. cup, and that is to say the cup of suffering, pass from mm -hmm. me. So he's asking, uh, you know, his father, you know, that the, he, the suffering may pass him by, which is a perfectly good prayer. But then he says, but if not, mm -hmm. then thy will be done. And we've got to remember right. that too, that, you know, um, God will take care of us even if we're um, trying to you know, um, we're worried about somebody, we're worried about something that's happened in our lives and so forth. Don't worry, God will be there. And mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, our uh, God's going to keep us on the path to salvation. That's what makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, whether we live in this house or that house, have this job or that job, et cetera, et cetera. The main thing is, is that we um, get to heaven and stay on the pathway uh, to salvation, trust in the Lord, He's going to help us out. He sends people into our lives to help us out. Oh, my gosh, I have so many stories of people that I know where, you know, somebody, you know, they're just in desperation, absolutely desperation, mm -hmm. and something will happen, and uh, they, somebody will give them a check for X amount of money, and, the, you know, that keeps them going mm -hmm. until they can, another event can happen in their lives and so forth and so on. But anyway, right. so many different uh, possibilities. But, uh, yeah, uh, you don't have to, as, as Mother Angelica right. says, it may not make it to your stomach, but <laughs> right. if it doesn't, know that the Holy Spirit there is, is there anyway guiding you, right. and Absolutely. especially guiding you to your salvation. He's going to get you some people who will help you. And if not, you know, what's the worst that can happen? 
You know, I mean, worst that can happen is, well, we might get sick or something, or, right. you know, we, um, we might have a real difficult yeah. and challenging time. Yeah. But so long as we get to heaven, that's what matters. Right. Worst case scenario, it is, they'd say, right? So, uh, yeah, exactly. Here's another question in our closing about about five sure. minutes. Dear Father Spitzer, a okay. Catholic member of our family who has a hereditary disease wants to marry and start a family. However, he's concerned about passing on the disease to his children. He wants to use in vitro fertilization to select which embryos do not have the disease and are safe to implant. Is this not a form of eugenics? He overlooks that if his mother had done the same, he would not exist. Mike. Well, you answered your own question. I mean, first of all, it is a form of eugenics. Second of all, remember, with every IVF solution, you know, as I always point out, they're going to have to, they have to make multiple right fertilized embryos, and then once those embryos, if they're in a state of attachment and they're growing, well, what's going to happen? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so they say, well, do, they'll come and say, well, do you want eight children? Well, no. You know, well, we have to get rid of seven of them there, and then the uh, and the needle with the potassium cyanide, you know, bingo, bingo, bingo. Mm -hmm. So you're killing the ones that. Well, we're not selected. Mm -hmm. And of course, you are absolutely right. It is eugenics through and through. And so it should never be done. And finally, mm -hmm. your final answer to the question is absolutely correct. You ought to be taking my place on the show because you're <laughs> right on the, on the marker. Yeah, what you're saying is, hey, do you realize that if your mom had done this, you wouldn't be around? So, I mean, uh, I would not do the IVF uh, solution. I would mm. let God take care of it. Just have a, a child the normal way, and God will take care of it. And, and if, the, you know, like, you know, it could be the case that if I had had children, you know, I could have passed on a hereditary disease to them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I can get along with RP. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, RP is preferable to death. And by the way, RP hasn't, sh you know, retinitis pigmentosa has not slowed me down mm. one iota. I'm still publishing the same amount, speaking the same amount, going on television the same amount. I mean, nothing's slowing me down. I mean, um, that God sends people into our lives where we can be as effective as we need to be. And above all, we're loving the people that mm. we should love, taking care of the people we should take care of, giving an example uh, in the way we should give an example. The worst thing that can happen is not a hereditary disease. You can adapt to hereditary diseases. And by the way, there are lots of programs for people who do have such hereditary disease. If they get in financial difficulties, there are lots of programs that we have, good social programs, where people can uh, get the right. funds uh, to sustain themselves, and plus lots of people mm -hmm. that the Lord sends into our lives to help right. us out. So, like yeah, just, I would say, don't do the IVF. Like thing. your iJone, right? There, your iJone there, you got the, the updated yeah, my version. Yeah, Exactly. Updated, really got the updated version too, so the latest one. So, <laughs> so we have two minutes That's for right. one last question. Dear Father okay. Spitzer, I've heard that angels were created as higher creatures than humans since they have an intellect and power we can't even imagine. However, I believe God created angels to be his servants. Is this correct? Are humans dearer to God and more loved by God because he created us to be his children? Gabriella. Well, Gabriella, actually, I think, uh, um, you know, God loves the angels as much as he loves us, and he loves us as much as he loves the angels. So I don't think the love quotient is uh, different, but the power quotient, as you pointed out, Gabriella, is different. They do have greater mentative po uh, intellectual power uh, than human beings do. They do have a foresight and a form of transtemporality that we do not enjoy, and a variety of some other things, uh, but they are his servants, but we are his servants too, right? So human beings, we uh, are not only sons and daughters, but we are also there uh, to uh, serve his kingdom and to do uh, the best that we can because service is a part of loving God. To praise, reverence, and serve is another way of saying to love mm -hmm. God. So um, that's our task, and uh, as we learned in our Baltimore Catechism, but it's the angel's task too, to mm -hmm. praise, reverence, and serve God. And so 
so uh, again, God loves us equally, but they just happen to have more power, and God likes, as we know, variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I'm very happy to be a human being, because boy, I, I'm just thinking, what if I didn't have the chance to take back some of the dumb things I thought about <laughs> doing? So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'm very happy to be a human being. I don't want uh, any more power, and of course, I couldn't ask for any more love than the unconditional and infinite love of God, which we will enjoy for all eternity. What could be better than that? Absolutely. On that point, we shall ask for your blessing. Oh, perfect. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And dear Lord, we know the creativity, the love into which you have created us and the joy for which you have created us. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless all of these good people with an anticipation of that joy, of that creativity, of that love, of that goodness into which they will be conformed with all of the other blessed in heaven and above all with you. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, as always, for those great answers, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next time. And don't forget about Father Spitzer's books through EWTN Religious Catalog, which contains so many of the answers you, you've heard on the program today and throughout the run of the series. Next week, we return to topics from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives. Don't miss it. And don't forget to join me this week for a new EWTN Bookmark show Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time as well. And be sure to take EWTN with you everywhere you go by downloading our free EWTN app. As we mentioned, you'll never miss a Father Spitzer's Universe or miss the Rosary because it's on the app with all the other great programs. And get it at EWTNapps.com. I'm Doug Keck. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.